morning, church. Stay up and sing today. Worship the Lord together in one voice.
Do you believe that? Lord, there's nothing better than you. It kind of plays into a psalm that I read this morning in my quiet time, Psalm 73. It says, Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. Just what we sang. But my flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart. My flesh and my heart may fail. It probably has, and it probably will again. So that we enter into a time of confession now where we bring those failures before God and confess them, humbly bring them before God. But before we do that, I'm going to give you a moment to just to bring those confessions before Him before we all confess together. But first, before you do that, praise Him. Praise Him for who He is. Praise Him for His strength. Praise Him for being your refuge. Praise Him because there is nothing greater than Him. Verse 28 ends Psalm 73. But as for me, God's presence is my good. There is nothing better than having Him present in our lives. I have made the Lord God my refuge so I can tell about all you do. So I give you a moment here and go to God. Tell Him, draw near to Him in your confession that He's your strength, your refuge, your joy, your life. You're all, you're everything. And thank Him for His grace and mercy. So let's go to Him for a moment. Praise Him. And then bring those flesh failings before him, and then we'll confess together. Father, you are the King of kings, Lord of lords. How great is your name. You are the great I am. Our desire should be nothing but you, but our flesh and heart wander and they fail. Please forgive us. Draw us into your presence this morning. Draw us to your grace, your mercy, and your strength. Be our refuge. And so when we leave this place this morning, we can tell about all the great things that you do. So let us confess together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from you always like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended you against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, According to your promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord, grant that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of his holy name. And everybody said, Amen.
Good morning. Uh, Scripture reading is going to be from Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Spoke your name into the 
our prayer this morning that you would be our vision. God, that as we hear your word today, as we listen to your scriptures, that you would give us uh, that a heart that is open, that a posture that is humble before you. Lord, that today would be a day where you speak directly to us through your scriptures and through Pastor Chan. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You would remain standing. High King of Heaven. What a great title. Uh, I was in the back thinking about how special it was as a dad to baptize both of my sons. But hearing them read scripture in church is pretty cool too. Joshua 2, we're going to read a lot. We're going to read 21 verses today. This is a narrative, and we need all of these verses to go along with us on the journey. So here we go. You listen quickly, I'll read quickly. And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and they lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. These must have been horrible spies. It took about four seconds for the king to know they were there. But the woman who had taken the two, had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order, in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, Please listen up. I know that the Lord has given you the land. 
and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, Jordan, to Sihon and Og, who was the king of Bashan, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and my mother, my brothers and my sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go your way. The men said to her, We will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if, his, if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. I'm glad you hung in there for all of that. Uh, just as a warning, that's going to be some of what we see over the next eight or nine weeks as we're working our way through this series. Uh, we're preaching narrative in the Old Testament, and it's a fascinating story. Uh, last year, about this time, we preached a sermon series called Exodus, which was not just the book of Exodus, but a little wider than that. It was the story of the Exodus, and we saw the Israelites and really in, in trying to give you a framework for us beginning to see what we see in the Old Testament with the prophets, because that's what's coming in the next couple of years. We're going to start preaching through some prophets, but you have to know the backstory. How did the Israelites get to where they were? So they were in slavery in Egypt. They came out of Egypt. Should have been a two and a half week journey. They got really good at wandering and complaining. Anybody else in here good at wandering <laughs> and complaining? Yes. So what we see, if you have your sermon notes page and you can follow along with me, we're going to move quickly through uh, the points on the back, but we're going to be referring back to this story. So you have all of it there in front of you. You can follow along. We're not going to reread the whole thing. But our sermon title today, as you see, is called An Unlikely Redemption, which I think is a pretty great <laughs> subtitle for the story of Rahab, An Unlikely Redemption. There's really no human reason why this woman should have had the opportunity to be included in God's story, and yet she was in a pretty incredible way, as we're going to see. Uh, this, the, the idea behind this unlikely redemption is that God... Listen up, this is big. God uses unlikely persons to proclaim the message of the cross for the salvation of sinners. Did you know that God uses unlikely persons to proclaim the message of the cross? Do me a favor and look around right now. God uses unlikely persons to proclaim the message of the cross. That is, in fact, the message of the cross. The subtitle of the cross could be, God, I can't believe you picked them. <laughs> Talking about you and me, right? I can't believe, yeah, we can't believe it either, but this is the story. Uh, the Promised Land is the ser sermon series title, but, and, and we talked about this last week, that, that title, that phrase, that verbiage is actually not used in the Old Testament or really anywhere in Scripture, but it's a pretty fitting title for this land that was promised to these people, right? To the Israelites. And this was really for them, it represented a place of plenty, but as we saw last week, and this is going to be a theme that carries through every week, it was a land of plenty for them, but only if they were able to be obedient and only if they trusted God. You can dwell in God's land of promise if you, if you are obedient. And again, we said this last week, 
They were expelled from the land. Ultimately, they didn't get to stay in the land. They went into captivity. God didn't stop loving them. They didn't stop being His children. But they didn't get to experience the blessing and the plenty and all the things that God had for them in the land. So the Abrahamic covenant, which, which is really kind of the, the narrative for this whole thing that launches the whole thing, uh, it's in Genesis 12. Uh, we have this verse, and this is actually just the tail end of the covenant. I will bless, who does it say? Yeah, the underline is the hint, right? I will bless who? Those who bless you. Okay, for just a second, think with me. Because I think sometimes we think of Judaism, right? The Israelites, and really maybe even the Abrahamic covenant, that it, was, that it was exclusive. Like the purpose was to tell other people they couldn't be a part. But that's not what that says, is it? I'm going to bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, who is going to get to be blessed? Say it out loud. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Tell me, theologian, how would they be blessed? Don't ever think it. It's a Sunday school answer. It's Jesus. They would be blessed through Jesus, right? <laughs> Some of you are laughing because you knew where I was going, right? No, no, don't overthink it. Sunday school answers, by the way, are God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. That's your, those are your answers. And they're the right answers to a lot of questions, right? Listen, this is not about exclusion. And I want you to catch this because I think the story of Rahab is a beautiful illustration of this. It's about the nation of Israel being a conduit. They were a conduit through which God's blessing could flow to, any, to all who may come. Throw the doors open wide. Anybody who wants to be a part of this gets to be a part of it. And you say, anybody? And I say, yeah, absolutely. That's what God said. And you say, can you prove it? And I say, let me tell you the story of Rahab. On paper, there's not a reason in the world that she could, should have been included in this. And yet, when it was most important, as we're going to see, she actually got it right. The outworking of the Abrahamic covenant is that God has a very inclusive interest and a providential care for any and all who will confess Him as sovereign Lord. We don't have to get it right all the time. But when we rearrange ourselves under His leadership, He wants to include, He wants to provide providential care. And so in this room, and this is where we're going to set the stage for this, and then we're going to move quickly, okay? In this room, as always, and I say this often, but it's true often. In fact, it's true every week. When you get this many people in a church service, there is no doubt that on the spectrum of belief, there are people all over the map. Probably almost every degree is represented, right? There are some of you who have been believers a long time. There are some of you who have been believers a lot longer than I've been alive, okay? That's cool. I've been in church my entire life. I'm kind of there with you. Okay? There are others who are in the process. They're on a journey. I think we don't think of faith as a journey, but it really is a journey. And so as you're on that journey, you know, I even think back to before I truly put my faith in Christ, my journey started before that because God started calling me to Him. I started moving towards Him, right? It's always moving towards God. Some of you are early in the journey. Some of you have just confessed faith in Christ. We've got a few baptisms coming up, which is always fun. We get to celebrate that, right? Some of you aren't sure. And some of you said, I don't really know about any of this. Like, I came here because somebody offered me to buy my lunch after, right? <laughs> We're glad you're here. El Torito is a great place to eat. You're up north anyway. You should go try it out, right? But for all of us, we have pockets of our lives. Even those of you who have been believers longer than I've been alive, you have pockets of your life that are anything but a promised land, don't you? We still have pockets of our life that we need to bring back under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We have pockets of our life where we still have some surrendering to do. Is anybody besides me that's true in here? Yeah? yeah? You should shake your head because it's true for you whether you know it's true or not. We all have those areas of our lives where we're kind of still choosing to live for ourselves instead of for God. Maybe in part, maybe as a whole. For some of us, it's our sexual purity or maybe we should say lack of it. Um, whatever that looks like for you, that can be a real thing and it is a real thing, right? 
And for some of us, we've said, God, if you think of your life like a house, right, there are some rooms where you've just closed the door and said, God, you're not welcome in that room, right? For some of us, maybe it would be our, our finances. For some of us, especially in this season, it's our political rhetoric. See, you thought it couldn't get any worse when I talked about sexual purity. <laughs> and I just made it worse. Oh, I should figure out the trifecta and do that one next, and we would just be right there. No, I just, here it is. For some of us, it's our political rhetoric. For some of us, it's just the way we talk to people in general, whether it's in person or whether it's texting. Maybe it's online. Maybe it's a specific person. I'll get it out in a minute. A specific person. Maybe for you, it's a parent or a child. And every time you talk to them, you know you shouldn't do it, but you just choose to do it anyway. I'm with you. Those aren't the ones that I struggle with. I have different ones. But this describes for so many of us our faith journey. It's the way we treat our spouse. It's the way we treat our kids. Maybe it's our work ethic. Ouch, maybe that was the trifecta. How do you navigate, hey, how do you navigate your worst moment? What do you do when you come face to face with the idea that you're acting in ways that don't honor God. Even if you are a believer, even if you would name the name of Christ, what do we do? How do we respond when it becomes plainly obvious that there's an area of our life, and for some of us it's the whole thing, right? When we're living in rebellion against God, what do we do? What do you do when you find yourself not on the wrong side of history, which is a phrase that likes to be thrown about now, but on the wrong side of God. That's actually worse, y'all. What do you do? How do you respond? So in the narrative, Moses dies. We, we, last week was part one of this series, and we kind of got Moses' final charge. He dies. He doesn't get to go into the promised land, which is sad, but that's, this whole story in many ways is just sad. Like they did take the promised land, but not the way God wanted them to. They didn't get to experience everything God wanted them to experience. So here's Moses. He dies. Joshua is now the leader. And these folks who had, you know, become professional campers and wanderers on the edge of the promised land. I love this. I think it's such a vivid illustration of great and clear leadership. God tells Joshua three times in chapter 1, be strong and courageous. Anybody want to guess why he was telling Joshua three times to be strong and courageous? Because maybe so much he wasn't at that moment very strong and very courageous. So God kind of pulls him up and says, this is what we're going to do. This is the part that I love. And Joshua kind of starts circulating and says, hey guys, just spread the word through the camp that in three days we're going in the promised land. And can't you just imagine, like they had been camping for 40 years. Can't you just imagine how they're going, well, wait a second, what about? I don't know, but we're going in in three days. Yeah, but what are we going to do about? We'll figure it out, but also we're going in in three days. Start lacing up your boots, right? I don't think they actually could lace up their boots, but you get the point. We're going forward. It's this clear vision. It wasn't Joshua's vision. It was God's vision. So... They, they again spy out the land. This is the second time they've done that, specifically focused on Jericho, because as we know, and as we're going to cover in a couple weeks, we're going to talk about the story of Jericho, right? Because it's such a great story. So this is the spying. Go check it out. So they wind up in Rahab's house. Now, here's the thing. Rahab, as we're about to discuss, was a prostitute. That's not why they were at her house, okay? Because there is some, there's some speculation about this. But it's most likely that her house was just a house that was bigger, where it was kind of an inn, a place where travelers could stay. They probably weren't the only people staying there. That's not why they were there, okay? But they wind up at her house, and they meet her, and we kind of go into the story from there. And when I think about Rahab, there are two kind of key pivot points to me that... You know, hey, thousands of years ago, on the other side of the world, this story happened. But the two primary pivot points, this is the way that I see it, okay? The two primary pivot points in this story 
are true thousands of years later on this side of the world at your address and at my address. They're just true. Rahab's story is going to mirror your story and my story in ways that we don't maybe think about. Here's one of like kind of the first pivot point. Rahab was a dubious and unlikely convert. Like I love the story of Rahab and some of you are very familiar with it. Some of you know more about it than I do. And then others of you, you didn't even know this story was in there. Like you've never heard the story. You think it's fascinating. By the way, we read 21 verses. We didn't read the whole story. You should go back and read the whole story. It's fascinating. Fascinating. It's a great story. And yet, she was pretty dubious. There's a part of you, maybe, I know there's a part of me that thinks, God, you chose her? Really? Really? These are the best and the brightest that you're bringing into your kingdom? And of course God says, well, no, I let you in, Collins. (laughs) Right? It wasn't that funny. (laughs) Hey, but if you think about the context, she was in a culture where the entire culture was far from God. Far from God. And by the way, that was the point. This wasn't just a difference of opinion. These people were all living in rebellion against the God of the universe. And they were all given a chance. By the way, Rahab responds well. The rest of them don't respond well. They all had the same chance. In a culture that's far from God, she may have been the furthest away. Catch that context. We're in this culture where nobody, you know, we've got uh, Marduk and we've got uh, Baal and we've got all these gods that we worship. We maybe have a god for everything. We're not interested in the Israelites' god. We're scared to death because of the stories we've heard. Apparently they walked through a sea on dry ground. Yeah, word gets around. Even without Facebook, word gets around. (laughs) Something like that happens. I told you when we read the story, I I just think it's one of the most significant miracles in the Old Testament. He parted a sea so that maybe six million people could walk through on dry ground. When's the last time you've seen anything like that happen? Yeah, you bet they had heard. And yet, they were still rebellious. She was unethical. These are the two reasons why I think she was dubious and unlikely. Number one, she was unethical. Okay, well, she was a prostitute. And that's not a translation error. She she was a prostitute, right? Also, and if you know the story, or if you were just paying attention when we read it just now, you may have noticed she lies right in the middle of the story, right? Because the, the, the leaders come in, the leaders of Jericho come in and say, where are these men? Like I told you, they're apparently really bad spies. Because right away, everybody knows they're there. Where are they? And she says, oh, I sent them away. But no, they were right there hiding. And we can do everything that we can to justify, oh, but God brought good out of it. Yeah, God brings good out of your mess a lot, doesn't he? Let me say it a different way. God brings good out of my mess a lot, doesn't he? Just say amen. Yes. But it doesn't change the fact that she lied. Which was somehow, it was not sanctioned, but somehow also not disqualifying. If, I, if I'm being honest with you, and I'm sure somebody's going to come up afterwards and, and, you know, drop a theological answer on me. But there's a part of me when I read this, I go, I don't know exactly what to do with this. Other than to try to justify it somehow. She was unethical. And here's the big one. She wasn't just unethical, she was an outsider. She was an outsider. Go back with me to verses 8 and 9. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land and the fear of the Lord has fallen upon who? Say it again. She's an outsider. There's you and there's us. There's the Israelites and there's us here in Jericho. Right? Right? And that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. There's we and there's us. 
She was an outsider. And yet, my wife and I were talking about this last night. Um, it, by the way, I find this fascinating. The reason my wife and I were talking about it, for those of you who don't know, my wife is our children's minister. So she's down the hall teaching your kids. Teach them very well, by the way. Um, truth about scripture. And she's taught this to the kids already. How cool is this? They've heard the story of Rahab. It was age appropriate, so take a deep breath. <laughs> they didn't ask me to teach them because it might not have been age appropriate. I'm not the best person to teach kids. She's good, though. She's, and, but they've already unpacked this with the kids to help them understand the theological significance of this. This is what we were talking about. Rahab is one of five women in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew 1. First of all, the fact that women were included was revolutionary. Okay? You got Tamar, who was Judah's daughter-in-law. You have Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. Think about some of those names. She's not the only dubious one included. Throw the doors open wide. Everybody's invited? Hey, because nobody deserves to be invited. Therefore, everybody gets to be invited. How crazy is it that the one who was perhaps the furthest away chose to come running toward the truth and to believe and to believe strongly? One of the lessons that you and I can learn from the story of Rahab is to dwell in the land we must never forget. We are there by grace and not by merit. To dwell in the land, you and I must never forget that we are always, always, always there by grace and not by merit. If we begin to believe that we are here by merit or by our own performance, we are going to become religious and mean. Because it's a short jump to judging other people. I didn't get any amens. That's okay. The message of Rahab is that the farthest from God can come if you'll just stop trusting yourself. Because the truth is, all of those areas that we talked about before, whether it's relationships or politics or the way that we talk to people or our work, et work ethic or our, you know, our sexual ethic or whatever it is, those strongholds that you and I have in our life, the truth is we just still think that we know better than God. In that area, I'm going to close the door. God, you're not allowed in there. I'm going to do it my way. But if you'll stop trusting in yourself, you get to experience God's best. You get to experience God's promise in that area of your life. By the way, the reason that everyone in Jericho was nervous, they had heard about the Israelites. They had heard about the story of them crossing the Red Sea. And the reason everyone was nervous is because they were still choosing to live in rebellion against God. Think about it. We're nervous because even because of everything that we're heard, we've heard, we're still not going to submit. We're still going to fight you to the death knowing that we're going to lose. What an insane thing to say. But you and I say it, don't we? We do it. We have these areas of our life where we choose to live this way. And yet when we remember where we've been brought from, there's such a power in it. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save, what's the word? Okay, if he ended right there, it'd be a great verse, right? It's a trustworthy statement, deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, but he didn't stop. What does he say? Of whom I am foremost. foremost. Some of you are thinking chief, aren't you? Because that's the way that we all learned it. I love the imagery that Paul uses in this verse and in the verses around it. You know what he's saying? I am a testimony. As the one who was the furthest from God, I am a testimony that if God can save me, God can save anyone. So for you, who thinks that that area of your life is just too far long gone for God to speak into it, it's not. 
for you who think it's too late to surrender that area of your life to God. It's not. For you who think your story is too far gone because you've never surrendered your life to God at all in any way. And you think it's too late. It's never too late. Can I prove it to you? Yeah, he already saved the chief of sinners. That's the illustration. Rahab was an incredibly dubious and unlikely convert. But there's a positive side. I told you there were kind of two pivot points. That's one. The other one is that Rahab was a sincere and active convert. Rahab was a sincere and active convert. Listen, she was clearly very far from God, but she was also willing to do whatever it took to move towards Him, even if it meant lying to the king. Whatever it takes for me to switch sides, I'm going to do it. She was believing in, think about this, she was believing in and saying something that no one around her believed in or was saying. There's a lesson there. It's very possible that when God calls you to obedience, all of the voices around you won't agree. You should do it anyway. You should maybe find some different voices. You should maybe curate some things. You should maybe delete that app off of your phone. It matters. But she got it right. She got it right. We're going to read verse 11 very quickly. You see three things here. You ready? We're going to get information about Israel's reputation. We're going to get information about the Canaanites' fear. And then Rahab's faith. Here we go. As soon as we heard it, what did they hear? That's Israel's reputation. As soon as we heard this story that you had not only conquered these Amorite kings, but you walked across the Red Sea. As soon as we heard it, as soon as your reputation got here, our hearts melted. Why? Because we know we have to fight you. We're still living in rebellion against you. And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. Now you hear about their fear, right? It's not just the reputation, but the reputation inspires fear. Why? Because they're living in rebellion. Hey, why wasn't Rahab afraid? Come on, think with me. Because she had no intention of living in rebellion against these people. Can you prove it? Yeah. For the Lord your God, He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. In the heavens above and on the earth beneath. What a great echo. I was going to do this. We don't have time to do it. But you should go back and look. In fact, if you have a Bible and it has like cross-references... I haven't checked this out, but I'd be willing to bet you it's going to cross-reference you to some of the other passages where that language is used. It's incredible how right Rahab got it in this confession, how theologically accurate this was in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. She acknowledged, acknowledged God's dominion. That's what she was doing. Hey, there may be a lot of little G gods, and we're trying to worship all of them here, but there's a big G God, and he's God in the heavens above. And on the earth beneath. And by the way, it was unprompted. It was unprompted. They didn't ask her to give a dissertation. They didn't say, check this box if you believe that God is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath, right? She just said it. Clearly she had been thinking about this and praying about this. Clearly she was hearing the same stories but coming to a different conclusion. Because God was doing a work in her. She acknowledged God's dominion. She also acknowledged God's exclusivity. Because she says, for the Lord your God, He is God. In a land full of gods, little g, there's one big G God. And it's the God that you serve. And the God that I want to serve along with you. And though she, she takes action. She's already hidden them. Now she helps him understand how to escape. She basically says, hey, these guys who are after you, I sent them the wrong way, so if you'll go this way and hang out for a couple, three days, they'll get tired and come back, and then you're free to go. Just remember me when you're coming back this way. It's almost like she knew what was coming. Remember the story of the walls of Jericho? It's almost like she knew what was coming. When the Canaanites saw God for who he was, 
Their hearts melted in fear, but Rahab's heart leapt up in faith. Rather than running and hiding anymore, even in her, her unlikely status, right? Rather than running and hiding, she heard it and she said, I want to be a part of that. I don't want to do what I've been doing. If this land has been promised to someone, I want to get in on that. I want to be a part of God's best. So really what you see here, listen, you have this juxtaposition of God's testimony in the world, the world's response to that testimony, and then Rahab had to choose sides. It's actually that simple, isn't it? You know what? That's true for you and for me. When it comes to sexuality, God has a testimony, and the world's living in open rebellion against it. You have to choose sides. And it's true in the way that we parent, and it's true in the way that we view marriage, and it's true in the way that we live our lives, in the way that we treat others. We could go right down the list. How are we going to respond? How are we going to respond? I saw this this morning, actually, and I uh, texted it to myself because I wanted to use it. This is such a great quote. This is from Paul David Tripp. He says, the Bible requires us to make one painfully humbling admission. The, worst conf the, the one confession we work so hard to avoid that our deepest, most pervasive, and most abiding problem is us. Mm -hmm. What a great quote. If you can humbly make this admission, your life will never be the same. Rahab is such a beautiful picture of the story of repentance. She sees, she repents, and she puts her faith not in her getting it right, but in something bigger than her. My wife and I also, this is how much theology your kids are learning in the back because she picked up on this and before I could even say it, she had already said it. What a beautiful picture that Rahab gives us of the story of the Passover. It points back to the Passover. It points forward to the cross. Tie this scarlet cord. Stay in this room and just have faith. Wait, 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 wait. So you're telling me that like this whole thing's going to be destroyed? Right, but if you'll just put your faith not in anything that you've done, you can be covered. That's the message of the cross. It was the message of Passover. Don't put your faith in something that you've done. Put your faith in something that was done for you. Whether it's the whole thing for some of us who've never come to Christ, or whether it's pockets, we're still finding these pockets of rebellion, you and I are. The gospel is not just our entry into God's promises. It's also how we abide in and possess these promises. It's not just the gate to get us into the promised land. It's also how we get to live there. Stop trusting in yourself. Stop trusting in you to get it right. You say, well, Tim, I'm a Christian. I already did that. I bet if you and I walked together this week, we could still find some areas where you're trusting in yourself, couldn't we? And I'm not saying your salvation's at stake. But I want you to experience God's promise in every area. I want you to help recover God's design for your life. That's what he wants. That's what I want. Isn't that what you want? Yeah. To see God's design take place in every area of my life. So I've got these four things. If you have notes, I, these are not like fill in the blanks. You're just going to have to write them down. That's taking notes, you know. I've got four <laughs> steps here. I was going to do a slide, but I just thought I would do it this way. You can write down. Number one, put no trust in yourself. Just write it somewhere. You've got a lot of blank real estate there. Number one, put no trust in yourself. Whether it's in part or in whole. Put no trust in yourself. Number two, be wary of the voices around you. This is what Rahab had to do. It's what you have to do too. Be wary. Hey, what a time to live in. Not just because we're all so well connected to each other, maybe too connected at times, right? But what a great thing that you actually have the ability to curate the voices in your life. You should think about doing that. 
You should think about, did you know there's such a thing as addition by subtraction? Sometimes your life will get better if you stop listening to some people or some TV stations or some websites or some whatever. Curate those voices. Be wary of the voices around you. Number three, reorient yourself to God's perspective. That's what Rahab did. I'm not going to ask God to join me. I'm going to join him. Tell me what to do. Okay, stay in this room and hang the scarlet cord from your window. Okay, that's what I'm doing. Why? Because that's what God told me to do, and I have faith that he knows what he's talking about. So this is what we're going to do. Might not make sense to you or me, but this is not your story or my story. It's God's story. So we're going to do it his way. Reorient yourself to God's perspective. He is the God of all gods in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. (laughs) Number four, take action on your faith in God's calling. Take action on your faith in God's calling. In other words, don't just have faith that what God told you to do is going to work. Do it. Hide the spies. Send them out a different way. It may require you to risk something. Risk it anyway. This is when faith becomes real. This is when faith becomes sight. So we're going to pray together now. Psalm 121. Just the first two verses. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? You you know what I find fascinating about this? Is we don't know why he's lifting up his eyes to the hills. Is it because he thinks his help is going to come from the hills? Which clearly in this psalm is, no, we're not going to get help from anywhere but God, right? Is it that he thinks his help is going to come from the hills? Or does he think his attacker is going to come from the hills? Or maybe both. I don't know. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from where? The Lord Lord who made heaven and earth. We've got to stop looking for our help in anywhere other than Jesus Christ. We've got to always pursue His best. Listen to His counsel. Listen to His heart. Trust how much He loves you. And if you don't know how much He loves you, just look at the cross. He suffered and died so that you could be forgiven of your sins. And when you couple that with the incredible wisdom that we see that he exhibited when he was here, why would we not trust him more? So if if he says pray for our enemies, then we pray for our enemies. We may not feel like praying for our enemies, but we trust him and we take action on our faith and we do it anyway. Let's pray together. God, Thanks for your goodness. Thanks for your grace. Thanks that we can always look to you for help. And you may not always remove us from the difficulty, but you'll always be with us in it. And you'll always bring us through it if we'll trust in you rather than in ourselves or in others or in the circumstances that are going on around us. So I pray now for anyone here who has never put their faith in Jesus Christ to save them from their sins. Pray that you would give them the, the, the faith, the courage to take that step this morning. To pray to you and admit that they're a sinner that needs to be forgiven. And they're putting their faith in Jesus Christ. For those of us who have already done that, and we're still finding these pockets of rebellion where we want to see them brought under your lordship, Give us the courage to ask hard questions and to answer those questions well. Right now where you are, take a minute and pray. Ask God if he would help you to stop looking to the hills around you in worry. Ask him to help you stop looking at your circumstances in worry. the other side of that. Ask him to stop, help you to stop looking at the hills around you in hope. Ask him to give you gentle reminders, clear reminders, that your hope's not in the hills around you. Your hope's not in others. That's a dangerous place to put it. Your highest and biggest and best hope, your most secure hope is always, always, 
in the Lord. Use this as a prompt, right where you are. God, may I look to you for help in blank, for you are my creator. God, may I look to you for help in blank. How do you fill in the blank? For you are my creator. We thank you, God, that you allow the opportunity for outsiders to become insiders. We're all a testimony of that. That it really is through the nation of Israel that you've blessed the world. Really, the Abrahamic covenant has been fulfilled and is being fulfilled even now. And we've been grafted in through the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been given the opportunity to be a part of this story. And you've chosen, in many cases, those furthest from you, the riffraff and the unwanted. You've made them your children. I'm glad for that because I was maybe furthest away. Thank you for inclusion. Thank you for blessing. Thank you for the opportunity to experience joy and hope and peace. Thank you that no matter how wrong we get it this week, you're still going to love us. But we want to get it right. Because you already do love us. We want to respond to that love in obedience. And we want to experience your blessing. Give us the grace by your Holy Spirit to be faithfully obedient because of our love for you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You stand up, let's sing this together. Some of you may remember this song from a couple, uh, 25, 30 years ago. It's something special when we can sing throughout the scripture. We'll try to refresh your memories. You know it, let's sing it out. It's my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my
Well, we want to thank you so much for coming. Uh, we hope you've been blessed. If you have anything you want to pray about, uh, Tom is here. He's an elder. Uh, Danny, raise your hand, Danny. He's in the back. He's an elder. I'm here. We'd love to pray with you or talk to you. Um, yeah. A uh, couple of things uh, on uh, your takeaway card. If you didn't get one of these, get one on the way out. This is how we do announcements, which is to say we don't actually announce things. We just give it to you and you can read it at home. Uh, but the first thing on here is a welcome lunch. We don't talk about this often, but actually we regularly give a chance to, uh, if people have, maybe you've been coming a little while, you have questions about the church, two weeks from today, uh, we're going to have another one of those where one of the elders will walk you through just kind of a brief explanation of who we are, like why are we, how are we organized, why do we care about what we care about, we'll feed you lunch and take care of your kids and all that, but you got to let us know you're coming. So come be a part of that if you want to. Uh, also, for uh, teardown today, what do we need to know, Eric? Chairs go down still. Chairs go down, stage, stage stays, stays, and the pipe and drape all stays. Okay. So let's have our benediction. This week, may you rest in the fact that the Lord your God is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. May you remember that even in your worst moments, a realignment with God's perspective and abandoning of your former ways is the proper gospel response to inclusion in God's kingdom. May you celebrate your inclusion even though you were an outsider. And may you be comforted by the true and vivid statement that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners into his coming kingdom even sinners such as you. Thanks for coming. Hope you have a great week. You're dismissed.